Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Scott Week. And we are so honored um, to have with us a very special guest that I'm so anxious to talk to and learn all about. And this is Lord Thurso. And he likes to be called John. John, welcome. Welcome to Scott Week 2022. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much for asking me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, to be with you. One of the joys I have when I talk to people um, uh, on the far side of the world, as you are at the moment, is I'm about to have a whiskey in a moment because it's that time of day here and I know you're confined to a cup of coffee. So I think I'm in a much better place than you are at the moment, but thank you for having me. Yes, we're so honoured to have you here and you are the chairman for Visit Scotland, who we work very closely with. Um, and so I want to talk to you about that, but I also want the viewers to know a little bit about yourself, if that's okay, and, and where you come from, and you are Lord Thurso, and can you tell the American audience what that means, and what that means to you? Well, um, I actually live in the small town of Thurso, which is on the north coast of Scotland. Uh, it's where you get the ferry to go to the Orkney Islands and my bedroom window, I look out, uh, if I look due north, there's nothing between me and the North Pole. And it's a wonderful part of the world. And I actually sleep in the bedroom I was born in, uh, which is not something everybody can say. My family, um, we are the Sinclairs, we're the Sinclairs of Ulster, which is a part of the clan Sinclair. Um, and we have been in Caithness, which is the county for, well, nearly 600 years. And my branch of the family have lived in Thurso in the house I live in, or iterations of it since about 1690. Um, my grandfather was um, a man called Sir Archibald Sinclair, and he was um, a well-known politician. He was a great friend of Winston Churchill. Uh, he was in the war cabinet. Uh, he was Secretary of State for Air. And after the war, he was made Lord Thurso, Viscount Thurso. Um, which my, my father inherited, uh, and then I inherited, um, and that's how I come to be Lord Thurso, but uh, I'm a, uh, we're, we're Sinclairs and we live in the far north. Wonderful, and the Orkneys, for all of you who haven't been there, are absolutely stunning, and so it just makes me think also, too, of being a great lover of whiskey. Highland Park, you must be well stocked with Highland Park. Well, Highland Park's marvellous. It's, um, it's a short ferry ride away, about an hour and a half. But uh, 20 miles on the mainland from my home is the county town of Wick. And there is a distillery there called Old Pulteney. And Old Pulteney is known as the Maritime Malt because it's right on the sea um, on the East Coast. It makes absolutely glorious whiskey and um, a number of different expressions. Uh, but it's in the same vein of being a northern whiskey like Highland Park. Um, so that's another one I would add to your collection. I'm a great lover of Old Putney. I had no idea that it was so close to Thurso. I must go and check it out. We have had whiskey tastings with it and it's delightful. It's super, really good. But a little bit more about you, if that's OK, and then we'll talk about Visit Scotland. So you are, as you self-describe, a recovering politician. You've been a member of the House of Lords and an MP. Do you want to talk a little bit about those experiences? Well, um, I, I, I never intended to go into politics. Um, and in fact, I uh, started after school. I trained as a, in the hotel business and worked for the Savoy Company in London and ended up running a hotel in Paris, uh, and then coming back and founding a stately home hotel just outside London called Cliveden. And my father died young, he was 72, uh, and I inherited his place in the House of Lords, because at that time, uh, all uh, people who inherited a, a, a being a Lord could go into the House of Lords. Uh, so I went and did that, um, found that I rather enjoyed it, became a spokesman. It was part time. So I was working and, and doing that. And then in 1999, we reformed our parliament and the hereditary peers, hereditary lords, um, were barred from sitting in the House of Lords, except for 92. <laughs> and it was the appointed 
peers who sat. So um, I was then asked to and became elected the Member of Parliament for the House of Commons for Caithness and Sutherland, which is the whole of the far north of Scotland. And I did that for 14 years and then duly lost, which is the lot of all politicians one day. Um, and then by an extraordinary um, stroke of um, fortune, uh, I was re-elected back into the House of Lords as one of the elected hereditaries. It, it's so complicated that only in this country could we ever have invented it. But uh, it means that I've done something that is constitutionally impossible to do now, which is start in the Lords, go to the Commons, go back to the Lords. And um, uh, then I, I am not a member of a political party um, because I represent the Queen in Caithness as the Lord Lieutenant of Caithness. And I am chairman of Visit Scotland, which is an apolitical um, position appointed by the Scottish government. And really all of the things I've done in my life from being in the hospitality industry to promoting Scotland to promoting business kind of came together in being chairman of Visit Scotland. And it's been an immense privilege and pleasure to do it for the last six years. And I'll do it for another couple of years and then my time will be finished. So this was an appointment for you? Yes, this I was appointed. Um, I've had some superb predecessors. Um, Mike Cantley was chairman before me and for that, uh, an old friend of mine um, who used to run Glen Eagles called Peter Lederer. Um, and it's like all public appointments, it's a time limited appointment. I'm appointed by the ministers of the Scottish government. We are what's called an arm's length body, but we report to the Scottish Parliament. Um, we are charged with uh, our fundamental task is to promote everything to do with the visitor economy in Scotland um, and to encourage people to come. And one of the tremendous links between um, the visitor economy that, and tourism is that it is a, a gateway to inward investment. Um, there is a clear link between people who come either for business events or as leisure tourists and then inward investment in Scotland. And there's a tremendous amount of the innovative side of Scotland uh, that links into the tourism side. So it, it, it pulls all that together in promoting Scotland, both as a marvellous place to come and visit for all the historic reasons, but also as a great place to visit for all the modern reasons. Yes, I think you and I are very much on the same page that way trying to promote a very modern Scotland. And there's so many wonderful things going on in Scotland. And surely within the last couple of years with the net zero and climate change summit that was held in Glasgow last year. And along those same lines and um, talking about tourism, what are some of the responsible tourism projects that you might be working on now and sustainability? And tell us about what you are most passionate about. Well, it, 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 it began about uh, well, nearly five years ago, but it was about four, four years ago, we really got quite serious about it, um, which is that uh, tourism, to my mind, is a tremendous force for good in that it is a, a wealth creator, uh, a job generator, uh, and it also is an industry which operates particularly well in some of the remoter areas. So it's a way of distributing um, wealth and jobs into areas that might not otherwise have them. So it, it's, it's an economically good and powerful force. But equally, we all need that sense of escape, that sense of well-being. And, and tourism, therefore, is a tremendous contributor to leisure um, and to enjoyment and mental health and lots of other things. So I, I'm a great believer in the fact that tourism is a force for good. But like anything, um, everything has its downsides. And accommodation and transport are both quite big users of carbon. Um, and obviously when people go in to visit communities, they use facilities and there might be competition with local people. So what uh, I've always said is that uh, the tourism is an economic activity where the object is to get the maximum economic value for the minimum environmental and social disruption. And we had been very good at the maximum economic value. And I, I felt we hadn't really thought through for the minimum disruption to either socially or, or environmentally. And I 
was particularly keen on reducing the carbon footprint, um, uh, which is so in line with all of the values of Scotland and our environment. And so I wrote a short paper for a, for a board, a way day, think day, which was about how do we basically green our business? And um, it was taken up by uh, a team in our senior leadership team, a wonderful group of, of young people who have developed it. And essentially now responsible tourism uh, is two strands. It's, it goes through everything that we actually do. One strand is about looking after host communities and making sure that there's a balance between the visitor and the community. And the other strand is about uh, sustainability of resource and lowering carbon. So one of the initiatives that we have looked at was um, in encouraging charging points for electric vehicles. And we have, uh, as a result of that, there are now a great many more of those. And, and I had a vision that you know, people arrive, however they got to, to, to um, Scotland, but you can hire an electric vehicle. It's a perfect way to tour because it's roughly that the, the range is slightly more than you might want to do in a day, but you can drive around uh, and you are not consuming any, any carbon you, because you're using an electric vehicle. And then we started to look at how you can take um, carbon out of the accommodation. And I've got a little pet project of my own that I'm working on, which is turning a five bedroom shooting lodge into a, 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 an upmarket bed and breakfast. And we've designed it so that with a combination of solar panels, little wind power and batteries, and then all put together, we reckon we can actually keep the house and provide hot water all year round without ever actually having to go onto the grid. And so if you are uh, doing a tour in our part of the world, you can travel with no carbon and you can stay with no carbon in places like us that are beginning to, to evolve. And our research shows that, that, that particularly the younger generations that is very important to them. And, and curiously, you can actually charge a bit more if you offer that product uh, because they are willing to pay for something that is not harming the planet. So those are just a very quick uh, couple of examples. That's fantastic. And I am, I'm so glad to hear that people are actually trying to um, come up with um, better ways of, of having electric cars get around Scotland. As a person who really loves to tour Scotland, I love the 500 up in your neck of the wood. That is one of my, my most favorite drives in all of the world. Um, it's very beautiful for those of you who haven't been there already, but just to hear that there might be charging stations um, along that route, maybe in and around Scotland, um, especially most especially one day, is fantastic. I remember the last time I was on that road, I generally do it every time I come to Scotland, but the last time I was on that road was 2018. And I was shocked how many people and buses were up there. Um, I had seen more than ever before, and there was a little bit of a, of a traffic jam up there at one point, just beyond Cape Wrath coming down. And so um, how wonderful that we can now have an electric car and drive well, down. I mean, the great, I, I know that bit of road very well down from Durness um, on, on, on down, and it's still single track. And uh, if you get a certain amount of traffic, it's a bit of a, a log jam. But one of the other things I've been doing, and I um, wrote an article for the Times about this, is what's called slow tourism. And it really, it's about saying, travel to somewhere, then stay put and enjoy it. Uh, in other words, take your time, uh, don't sort of, you know, travel as far as you can every day and then get up early and travel as far as you can the next day. But take time to enjoy where you are. Um, and it's like slow food. You know, you, it, it really, there is more flavour the longer you gently cook slow food. And I think slow tourism is very much the same thing. It's about travel, stay, enjoy. Uh, and that is something that encourages people to spend less time on the road and more time sampling. So if you're doing the North Coast 500, uh, rather than try and do it all as fast as possible, you know, come back every year for several years and enjoy different bits of it. That, that, that's one. And that's the other way we're trying to encourage um, 
uh, a, a sustainable approach is what I call greening the product. And it's about looking at ways and we, we can make the, the product that's offered um, a greener alternative. So for example, I talked to a number of the, the, the tour operators and suggested to them that instead of having big touring buses, they go for the smaller buses, which are electric engined, and then don't travel quite so far every day. And the chief executive of one company afterwards said she was delighted to hear that because that is actually what they were planning to do. And so you start to move from something that is producing a lot of uh, carbon emissions to something that isn't. Um, and it's a huge amount of work to do, but if we can keep gently pushing on it and greening the product, it was a, a group of guys come over, funnily enough, they come over from Texas and they go on bicycling holidays. And so now instead of um, a petrol or diesel van carrying their luggage between the hotels while they pedal, there's an electric van doing it. Um, and the result is that, that again, taken the carbon, carbon out of it. So there's a huge amount of development going on and it is a, it's a conscious strategic decision to do that rather more than um, it, it so it's not just oh let's do it. It, it it's actually thinking that through and encouraging people to do it whether by grants or by direction or, or whatever i think that's a wonderful idea and as a person who loves to travel around scotland and tour scotland myself i would also like to add if if it be okay that there are a great many wonderful and beautiful trails in scotland so i like to do exactly what you're talking about i like to pick a small town that maybe i've never been to before or really stopped in and stay and spend a couple of days and it's wonderful to talk to some local people and to find out where these trails are maybe pack a little picnic lunch to take with you, but just to get out on the trails and out in the open air. Scotland, the countryside is so beautiful and spectacular. I have never been anywhere in Scotland where I haven't been able to find a trail and go wander off and enjoy myself um, looking and the, at- one of, one, of the, one of the great things is, is you get a huge variety. Um, as you all know from going down the, the West Coast, you get these massive, uh, hills and this tremendous um, heatherscapes and with the sea outside and the white sand beaches. But then you go across to Caithness, my part, and you're in the flow country, which I think is likely to be made um, uh, a world heritage site quite soon. It's the biggest blanket bog in Europe um, and has more carbon captured in it than the entire rainforest of the Amazon. And it's an amazing uh, landscape. But then you go to Aberdeenshire and you go on the whiskey trail and you go through Murray. Um, those wonderful valleys, quite again quite different, wonderful rivers, and, and then down into the borders. There, there's a wonderful light park, um, which is a, a, about dark skies, um, which is down in the Dumfries and Galloway. So there's all different places you can go to all around Scotland, lots of variety. Yes, and it's very beautiful everywhere. The old down to the, the Trussex, the Isle of Skye. I just can't recommend um, discovering every nook and cranny that you can. And that's why I enjoy coming each and every year. Um, so, John, tell us a little bit about this year, um, the theme of the 2022 being the year of the stories. Well, we, we do this thing, which is we have a th themed years and we've been doing it for quite a long time, but we do one new theme every two years because we find that it takes a year to build into it and, uh, and do it. And the idea behind the year of stories is that Scotland is just full of tales. Some of them are tall tales, but there, there are lots and lots of tales. And it stretches right across um, the centuries. You, you go from the wonderful traditions of the, the, the Gallic um, uh, storytelling and all of the, the things that were recorded there and the, the sagas. And my part of the world, Orkney, Caithness, is very much Viking based. Um, and uh, you have the Okne Inga saga, all of these sort of wonderful tales. But then also you've got the great uh, writers. I mean, the greatest of the lot in many ways is our national bard Burns, 
but also Scott and lots of other writers, uh, the, the classic genre. But then in today's world, we've got um, uh, wonderful uh, television uh, programs and uh, films, Outlander, um, the Harry Potter films, the, 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 the viaduct that, that the train goes on. And these are all things that bring people to Scotland um, and that we can talk about. But also it would, has inspired people to actually create stories or, or thread things together into stories. So, for example, the National Trust for Scotland are doing a series of sort of trails, as it were, where they tell the story of their houses through the eyes of, of various inhabitants. Um, and it, it, it goes into the theatre and it goes into um, all sorts of areas. So it was just a marvellous way of bringing all sorts of aspects of Scotland and Scottish life together and giving people a hook to hang their tails on, basically. So whether it's just in a wonderful inn with a glass of peaty whiskey and a roaring peaty fire, uh, or whether it's in a theatre, or whether it's um, uh, in a visitor centre, the tales that we have to tell to, are really magical and say so much about Scotland and allow Scots to talk to visitors that we welcome uh, in a different way. How wonderful. And where can people go to find um, some more information about uh, where to go to find these areas where they can visit. Um, I know that Visit Scotland has a website. Uh, Visitscotland.com is our website. And uh, uh, I haven't been on it for a, a week or so, but I'm fairly certain that if you just go in there, you can click on Year of Stories and that'll take you into what's going on. And that the idea of the Visit Scotland website is not to tell you everything, but to have links to the people who can tell you. So it's a good gateway through to lots of different places. It makes me very homesick for Scotland when I go on that website, but I do enjoy it. And I've always encouraged everyone, if you haven't already, visit scotland.com. And what you really want to do is start planning your trip and your holiday now. You want to go and explore, as John is talking about, all these different people, all these different places, and really plan out your stay and the reasons why you're going to certain places and things that you would like to see. And maybe Maybe plan to come and discover more once you're in, actually in Scotland. I always love, just personally, I love to go into a local pub and meet local people and talk to them and find out more about themselves, where they come from, their families. And I've learned quite a lot doing that. And the, the wonderful thing, which we, the word we use uh, is to, to have the crack, which is the conversation from the Gaelic and, and you, you, if you go into any local um, sort of bar and there are a few old boys propping it up, you go, aye, aye, and what's it crack, boy? And they'll start talking to you and tell you what's going on and who's done what. It's always good fun. Yes, and they'll always point you in the right direction. Yeah. If you want to find a trail or a, a nice a meal, they'll point you in the right direction. So for 2022, the latest Visit Scotland campaign is Scotland is Calling. And let me just say, I hear and I'm going. I'm coming very soon. It's been Good. the longest time away ever. And um, what does that mean to you? And, and what would you like to tell our audience here in the United States and Americans maybe who have never been to Scotland before? Well, the, uh, the interesting thing is that um, I, I, I think at the heart and behind it all was, first of all, the fact that we've all been locked down for two years. Um, not quite locked down, but we travel has been difficult and certainly intercontinental travel has been difficult. Um, my daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren um, live in Toronto and, you know, we were meant to come two Christmases ago, but that got cancelled. They meant to come last Christmas, that got cancelled. So we're going for third time lucky this Christmas. So I know personally how difficult um, it's been for people traveling. And we wanted therefore to do more than just say, here we are, we're open for business. 
we wanted to say we are calling to you because we we feel it not having had you here and we're a hospitable nation and we really want to welcome you back to those of you who know us and love us uh, uh, and we really want to welcome those who haven't been um, for the first time and it's an unashamedly emotional appeal to Scotland and it is based on experiences because um, I feel, and I think we all view that actually we don't want to say come to Scotland a destination and stay in a place. If you look at all the conversation we've had um, today, it's been around the experiences you've enjoyed when you've been here in, in, in Scotland. And we've talked about the experiences of whiskey, or we've talked about the experiences of visiting places. So it's very much based around the different experiences the visitor can have. And that can be activity based or it can be place based or it can be uh, based around a whole lot of things. But it's an emotional appeal to um, uh, those who know us and love us to say we're here, we're open, we miss you. Um, and an appeal to those who have yet to come to say, uh, we'd love to to show you what we've got. Uh, so that's it is it's, it's more than hi we're open for business. It is we are calling to you across the sea um, to 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 come come back come and see us again. How wonderful! I'm extremely passionate about Scotland, and I will just tell everyone from the first time I went to Scotland as a young person and my foot touched the ground, I just felt enormous energy and passion for such a beautiful country. And I have personally traveled the world over, and there is no place um, on the entire earth such as Scotland. It's just so beautiful. As John was saying, there's so much to offer. You really must come and see. Once you do, you will want to come back again and again and again. And, and uh, you know, we've talked a lot about what you can do in the country, but one shouldn't forget that you've got um, several amazing cities in Scotland as well. Um, and obviously one starts with Edinburgh, uh, and, and there's just so much to do there. But Glasgow as well, which is city of culture, is the most amazing and vibrant place and is well worth spending time in. And going up the East Coast, Dundee, which has um, had a tremendous renaissance in recent times, is, is now home to um, uh, 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 amazing museums that have, have come up. Um, Aberdeen has got the most wonderful new um, a conference center called the PNJ. So there's and I'm, my nearest city, which is Inverness, which is a mere 110 miles south of my home, um, is another great place. So there are there are lots of lovely rural things to do, but there's a huge amount of built heritage and cityscapes to view as well. So there's lots of reasons to come back on multiple occasions to get to know it all. How wonderful. And I can't wait to be there again this August and I'll start my journey in Inverness. And I plan on traveling around and filming and showing some of the American audience here, such as yourselves who aren't able maybe to go this year, some little tidbits of Scotland. We're going to go into some towns, interview some people, see some things off the beaten track, as well as Inverness, Glasgow and Edinburgh as well. So. I look forward very much to doing that later um, the year in August. And I hope maybe one day we can meet in person, John. Well, that would be wonderful. And if you are doing the North Coast 500, you will go past uh, my house. Um, so you just have to tell us and come in and, and say hello. Let's do that for sure. Thank you so much for having me here today and for speaking to our audiences here in the United States. It is a great pleasure and an honor. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, it's really been fun to talk to you. Um, and we really appreciate what Scott Week does and all, all, all of you do. And um, all I can say is we are ready. The peat fire is on, the whiskey glass is charged and a lot of other kinds of things as well. But please come back and see us. We look forward to it. We will do. And everyone, please go to visitscotland.com right now. 
and start planning your trip. If you're not coming in 2022, you must get here 2023. And thank you so much for joining us and tuning in today.